those hybrids between uh, academia and practice. I started in practice. Um, I started uh, in IBM, and the KSRI is actually a public private partnership. Um, we started alongside with the initiative that Jim Spore started, the SME initiative. So I'm one of the sort of real life outcomes uh, for better or for worse. Um, so what I'd like to talk about um, right now is uh, take a step back and think about how technology and technology innovation has changed things um, over the past. And uh, say, take a step back, let's take 6,000 years back to the invention of the written language. Um, and that is important because before the invention of the written language, it was really expensive to carry around information and to move it around. If you want to carry around information, you had to carry the person around that had it in his head. You had to feed him, maybe a roof over his head wasn't bad up here. Um, so that was really expensive, uh, and only with the written word did it become feasible to organize yourselves in something other than clan size. So if you wanted to have a nation state, you couldn't really do that before the written word, simply because it wasn't feasible from an organizational point of view. And as you've seen in the talk, the um, subtitle is the end of hierarchy. Are we actually seeing the end of the utility of hierarchy as an organizational model? That's a question I want to throw out here today. Then obviously with Gutenberg, the invention of movable type printing um, was uh, another um, big bump downwards in the cost of um, copying and moving information. But the important thing there is not the technology, the important thing is the social consequences. If you think, for example, that before Gutenberg, um, copying a Bible was relatively expensive. Anybody have an idea how long that took? To copy a Bible by hand? Yeah, it basically took three years and a team of five people to copy one book. Now take your own salaries, which are no should be higher, but take your salaries, <laughs> multiply them by three and by five, and you get an idea of the kind of economic value you need to create in order to copy this one book. Now Gutenberg, when he um, invented movable type printing, he lowered basically the cost for um, copying a Bible in the book by something like 99%. Um, so suddenly you have totally different economics, and you had a similar discussion back then that you have today. People said, why do we need this stuff? Why do we need the books? All the good information are already out there. You know? uh, that sounds similar to the talks we have about blogs and other stuff around here. But the other major consequence is that the existing industries, the copying monks, who had a monopoly on copying information, lost their monopoly. They didn't like that a lot. Um, and you can't solve that with new incentive systems, okay? You can't pay the monk enough to be faster, um, you know, to do something in uh, uh, basically a day rather than three years. So there's a structural problem there that we have to deal with. And the other social impact was Protestantism. It wouldn't have existed without Gutenberg, because basically Luther nailed his 95 pieces um, uh, on the, on the uh, church doors and copied them using this new invention. So without this, the whole idea of Protestantism wouldn't have been around. And with the internet, of course, I'm going to tell you, uh, for the first time, we have a total separation of the, of the matter from the information. That's also the first time that our economics, which always used to be economics of matter, of using matter around, no longer work. And I'll show you an example of why they no longer work. The problem that they don't work is um, we've been taught about a world that no longer exists in such a way. So there are many things that we see now that we find surprising. But the main thing, if you look at innovation, is it resists, it results in a power shift. So if you do an innovation and nobody is getting upset, you're not doing it right. Um, and what we see here, for example, some of the power shifts, if you look at Haraka media, the traditional media companies, are now getting increasingly competition from self-organized media. Uh, self-publishing online, things like blogs and Wikipedia, media casting, semantic web. So these are happening, and they're, they're competing with the existing structures. Um, just a question, show of hands, who here is currently using or has used at some point a website called Neopedia? Okay, who's using Wikipedia? <laughs> That's interesting because Wikipedia was the first attempt by the same people to create what is now Wikipedia. The, the goal was always to have a free online encyclopedia with 100,000 articles, and the same team started it actually before, and they said, let's go with best practice. What's best practice? We get smart people to write articles, send them in, we get smart people to review them, and that's how we build a, an encyclopedia. After two years, they had 24 articles out of 100,000. They did a big calculation and realized they weren't going to be around to see the result. And that's important. Innovation happens when our current tools for solving our problems don't just fail, but fail spectacularly. Because if they fail by 50%, we try to make them work. If they fail spectacularly, such as 24 out of 100,000 articles, we look around for a better solution. And what they did was they said, well, we don't get enough articles sent in. And that's the problem. So they actually intended Wikipedia to just be the workshop. Never the real thing, just the workshop that would create more articles that they would then still put through the traditional review process. Well, it turns out they didn't need that anymore because they had discovered a new paradigm. 
Um, and that new paradigm uh, has been very well put by Linus Torvalds, the inventor of Linux, who said open source shows who is better, who can uh, do things better. You can't hide behind managers, or in today's world, you can't hide behind brands anymore. You, as individual consumers, are behind much smarter than companies that try to sell their product and service to you, and that's a problem for these companies if they are the deaf. Um, and one of the, of the ways you can see the problem um, in the IBM CEO study um, in uh, 2006, one of the things that came out was that the important sources for new ideas for innovation were, for a large part, external or internal, but not the internal R&D, but the general employee population. And another uh, example, just in terms of numbers, we've asked, what would it take for you to share your innovation idea with your provider? Uh, and of course, uh, against money, people, lots of things. Um, but only number two was, if I'm being listened to, if I feel I'm being listened to, I don't need a special incentive. And only roughly 11% say I'm not interested in sharing my ideas. So there's basically almost 90% of your customers out there who are willing to help you innovate as a company. You're just not listening to them. And that's something that maybe you should be changing. One example that this actually uh, provides value is the example of the Canon um, camera. The uh, Canon camera came out a couple of years ago. Really good hardware, um, but the software didn't do a few things that the video people would like. So they basically rewrote the software. Uh, and by rewriting the software, it created a product that competed almost against um, a product that's you know, basically 10 times as expensive. Um, now, Canon wasn't ex exactly too happy with that. They increased the encryption to, uh, on, this, on the device to prevent that. But this is something where you can see the individuals become much more active. Uh, one of the best things is by saying, when will consumers learn that it isn't their place to add value? So that is sort of a, a problem in the thinking of the companies. And we're seeing that even in other areas, this is happening. What you see here is a museum. It's actually run by Aaron Dunn. It's a non-profit project that says, why do I have to keep paying if I want to listen to music from, from Beethoven exactly? He's not getting any royalties anymore. So uh, why do I have to keep paying for individual discs? And he said, what we should do is we should collect money um, to actually buy and pay for the performance of this music, because the music, music itself is no longer copyright. Uh, if we buy for the performance, we can actually set it free. We can make the music freely available to everyone once we pay for this performance. So this guy is actually currently doing, and there's going to be um, the recordings in the summer. He collected something like $70,000 in Kickstarter to do exactly that. And he's going to start recording stuff um, this summer. And he's doing, as an individual, in his spare time, more for basically the heritage of human, of human culture than most of the cultural ministries around the world. <laughs> An interesting effect there. So basically what we're seeing there is the traditional centralized way of which we think uh, in competition in the market, which is basically the game of chess, um, is getting competition by the Japanese game of Go, um, which basically uh, says we have individual pieces and the value of the pieces uh, derives wholly from their relationship to the other pieces around them. And what we believe is happening is basically this, um, that we have the companies still set up as a traditional hierarchy you know, to do their bet against other companies, but they're being surrounded by increasingly smarter individuals, millennials, also older uh, individuals, and I'm not sure that I would want to play white um, in this context. Um, so basically, what you have to realize if you're a company, you have to change not only your structure, but also your culture. Probably if you want to change something, you will get resistance. This quote up there that you can read, uh, anyone know who the famous uh, mentioned consultant is that wrote that, but resistance to change, or actually Machiavelli. So it's uh, not an entirely new problem. Um, and the, the issue there um, is basically that we're looking at this at this uh, idea of a company um, as being an iceberg, and we're playing around with the top part, and we're moving over the top part, but if we're not moving around the bottom part as well, that is never going to float. And that is part of the problem when I want to, want to sort of get into the ideas in the heads. Um, and to wrap it up, basically, if you don't remember anything of what I said, try to remember these two things. Uh, first of all, if everything seems under control, you're not moving fast enough. Our idea and our preoccupation with precision and total control is making us too slow, and that's not the way the world works anymore. And we have to rethink. We have to become comfortable with risk again, which we, we sort of lost uh, our ability to do. And the other quote is, try to relax and enjoy the crisis, because it is a crisis for the traditional structures of creating value and of communicating among each other. But there is huge potential for all of us as individuals to learn from it. And if you think of the new open piece, uh, to do something actually good for the world. Uh, so thank you, I know it was a truly force uh, within the 10 minutes. Um, and now we go back, of course, to the panel. Thanks.